Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We welcome you to worship on this beautiful, sunshiny day. Um, I think the sunshine's a little deceiving because it's rather chilly out, uh, but it's great to have the sun out anyway. Um, there are a number of things I would like to draw your attention to as you are passing the fellowship pads down the, uh, the row and back. Okay. Um, I'm going to be gone next week, as uh, I think most of you know. I am heading out to Dubuque for uh, the opportunity to present my Doctor of Ministry work and um, presumably receive a degree for that. So um, I will be absent next week, so there will be no pastor's forum. Uh, but Dave Henderson is coming down from the UP to preach, and I hope you will give him a warm welcome. Okay. Would like to also draw your attention to a um, mission opportunity You'll notice there is a basket out in the narthex that is there for uh, children's clothes. Okay. The uh, Blackbird Elementary clothes closet needs some replenishment. Okay. And so you're invited to participate in that. Okay. And also for those of you who, um, you know, we have many people who attend, some who are members, some who are just here regularly. Uh, for those of you who are members, would like to invite you to uh, prayerfully consider the opportunity to serve the larger church by getting more involved in the presbytery. Okay. Our uh, presbytery is looking for people who are interested in serving on some of, the, uh, some of the committees or ministry teams. And if that is something that God has, um, has or will place on your heart, um, you can give Joe Leach a call and let him know that. Okay. And now, let us turn our hearts and our minds to the worship of our God as we listen to our prelude this morning.
please join me in the call to worship. O come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Please rise and body your spirit for our opening hymn number 460. be seated. Let us pray. God of power, you called from death our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Send us shepherds to rescue the lost, to heal the injured, and to feed one another with knowledge and understanding. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, when we come before this holy God we worship, we recognize that we fall short, that we are not the people that God calls us to be. We are not yet the people that God will make us. And so recognizing our shortcoming, we come before God confessing our sin, confident of his love and his forgiveness. So let us confess our sin before God and one another, first silently and then together using the printed prayer.
and praying together. God of love, in the wrong we have done and in the good we have not done, we have sinned in ignorance, we have sinned in weakness, we have sinned through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry. We repent and turn to you. Forgive us and renew our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news. To all who turn from sin in sorrow, to all who turn to God in hope, this is God's word of grace. We are accepted. We are forgiven. We are loved. This gift we have from God because of Jesus Christ. And as we rise uh, for the singing of the Gloria, I would remind you that we are currently singing the Gloria in round. Yeah. So we are going to sing together, and then we are going to sing twice in round with this half of the congregation singing first. This will come in second. And the, Are you guys going to... We're going to just do first and second, and these lovely ladies are going to assist us with their halves. And I will uh, signal when to come in. So... Well done. So. You may be seated. Mm, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To this peace we were called as members of a single body. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. As, uh, as the adults sit down and take their spaces, if any children are here, if you would come up and join me, I would really appreciate it. I know Christopher and Kelly are here. Who else? Please come on up. Oh, there's a friend. Thank you. Come on up. All right, we're going to talk sheep today. I brought my, uh, my little sheep to help me. I brought him from the nursery, and I'm going to put him in the sheep pen. Um, the, the passage today in John is all about sheep. And I've never owned sheep, so I don't know much about sheep, except we've talked about it. Sheep are not very smart, are they? I know that. Sheep get into all kinds of trouble because they're not very smart. Um, so I did some investigating this week. And do you know that in the Bible... There's more than 500 references to sheep or shepherds. A lot. 
It's a lot of talking about sheep. Um, today, if you've been listening in our bulletin, in the in the songs that we've been singing, in the, there's a lot of talk about sheep. So why do you suppose that is? What do you think? Any ideas? No. Well, what do you think, Christopher? We are we are the sheep. He whispered, "We are. We're just like sheep. We need a shepherd." Um, I did a re- some reading. And I found out there was a man not very long ago who wanted to know more about sheep and shepherds because of all the references in scripture. So he traveled to the Middle East, which is where Jesus lived a long time ago in the Middle East. And he hung out with some shepherds for a while just to figure it out. And there's some things that he learned that I thought were very interesting. I just want to share a couple of them with you today. Um, Shepherds know their sheep really well. He found out that a shepherd could, would know right away if something was wrong with one of his sheep. Um, the shepherd knows which of their sheep are shy, which are skittish, which ones are bold or maybe a little too curious, so you're going to get into trouble. Um, he knows the sheep, and many of the shepherds have small herds, small flocks, so small enough that they have a name for each of their sheep, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, and the other thing he found out is that sheep know their shepherds. They trust their shepherds uh, with their lives. They, sh- they trust their shepherds, but they recognize their shepherd's voice. And um, when he was living over there for this period of time, he, he was watching the shepherds as they came uh, at the end of the day. They brought their sheep to a sheep pen, and in the Middle East... Uh, it's pretty desert-like, so there's a lot of rocks. So their sheep pen was actually made of a rock wall, but it was kind of like this. It had four sides with a little opening for the gate. Jesus even talks about that he is like the gate of the sheep pen. Um, And they'd bring their sheep in, so multiple flocks would come and they'd stay in this sheep pen at night. And the top of the sheep pen would have thorns or something that would keep wild animals from getting into, you know, jumping over the wall. And um, they had a gatekeeper. One of the shepherds would stay right by the gate and make sure that the sheep were safe, that no thieves came to steal any of the sheep. And he watched, and he thought, how are they going to do this tomorrow morning when all of these sheep are here and they have to get these sheep out? How's this going to work? And what he found out was that the shepherds came to the, to the gate, and they, they called out, Tahu, Tahu. And the sheep recognized their shepherd's voice. And in a matter of minutes, the sheep had gathered by flock. So this flock would follow this shepherd, and this flock would follow this shepherd, and this, in just a few minutes, they could do this. They brought a a stranger in to call to the sheep just to see what happened so he could see, and he called out, Tahu, Tahu, and the sheep actually ran away from the stranger's voice. So even though we think of sheep as being kind of stupid, they're smart enough to recognize their shepherd and to trust their shepherd. This is what Jesus has to say in the book of John. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I have come that they, that's you and me, his sheep, may have life and have it to the full. Pretty cool, huh? I'm really glad that Jesus is my shepherd and that I can hear his voice and that he knows me by name. Let's say a prayer. Jesus, our good shepherd, thank you for calling us each by name for knowing us and loving us and guiding us. Help us to hear your voice and teach us how to follow you closely all the days of our lives. Amen.
Please pray with me. God of life, your spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Your spirit inspired the prophets and writers of scripture. Your spirit draws us to Christ and helps us to acknowledge him as Lord. We ask that you will send your spirit now to give us deeper insight, encouragement, faith, and hope through the proclamation of the Easter gospel. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. The book of Acts gives us a glimpse of the early church and a reminder for us today of what it means to be the church. Here is what the Spirit is saying to the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading this morning (coughs) is from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. In our gospel reading today, Jesus clarifies how He is different from everyone who has come before. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The word of the Lord. Our psalm today has a sung refrain, so we will sing the refrain uh, together, and then I will uh, read portions and indicate when we enter in with the refrain again. is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. 
Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. You prepare a table before me, in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Shepherd me, O God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death For our epistle reading this morning, we continue to read from 1 Peter. This morning, we are reading, uh, it says in your bulletin, from verses 19 through 25, but I'm actually going to start at verse 18, and I will explain why in a moment. So let us attend to God's word for us this morning. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is this to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth May the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight. You are our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. So as I mentioned, our uh, appointed lectionary reading for the day begins at 19. They skip 18, and I think the reason why is because it's an uncomfortable verse. It talks about slaves. And it's been misused at times. But I think it's important for us to include it as well. One, because, you know, if you go and you read this passage, you're going to see it's there, right? Um, and we don't want to act as though things are not in the Bible that are in the Bible. Yeah. But it's also important to understand its context. The idea of slaves being in the Bible is something that we struggle with because it sounds like maybe the Bible is, is saying slavery is okay, okay? but it's not. Okay? At the time when Peter was writing, slavery was, was just a way of life. It was everywhere. Okay? And neither Peter nor the other writers are saying this is a good thing. In fact, it says quite clearly it's unjust. 
but it was a reality that had to be dealt with. And what is interesting about this passage, beginning at verse 18 and continuing on to chapter 3, this section of 1 Peter is a, a kind of document known as a household code. Back in the ancient world, it was common for philosophers and, and senators and others to, to write a household code, which was advice to the family on how you're supposed to behave as family, how to get along. It was kind of, you know, the um, Ann Landers of, of the age, right? <laughs> the fascinating thing, though, is that prior to Christian writings, Slaves were never mentioned in household codes. They weren't considered part of the family. But as Paul writes in Christ, there is no slave or free. And so Peter writes to the slaves in the family as well, as a reminder that they are part of the family. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. He goes on to talk about unjust suffering. And what could be more unjust than suffering as a slave? And so Peter addresses that. He says, it's commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. Not because they're tough. Not because they're trying to make a point. But because they are conscious of God. The reality is that if we are seeking to follow the God we know in Jesus Christ, there are times when we suffer unjustly. There are other kinds of suffering that happens. There's there's suffering that happens because we're stupid. We do things that are dumb and we pay the price. And there's suffering that happens just because the way the world is. There are earthquakes, there are tornadoes, there are tsunamis. And those result in suffering. But there's suffering that happens because we're trying to do the right thing. I think of those men and women, those families during the time of World War II, who sought to shelter Jews from the Nazis and to to get them to places of safety. And how often they suffered for that how often they were imprisoned and sometimes killed. Unjust suffering because they were doing the right thing. I think of of our own country. And in the 60s, as we were seeking and continue to seek to deal with, with what has come down from the chattel slavery of our early years, In the 60s, during the civil rights movement, when men and women stood up for the rights of our African-American brothers and sisters and said, you cannot treat people different under the law. And many suffered for it. Both African-Americans and and Anglo-Americans and others who faced chastisement, faced imprisonment, and sometimes were killed for standing up for the right thing. If we are seeking to follow Christ and to be the kind of people that Jesus calls us to be, there are times when we will suffer. In fact, Peter says we're called to it. Now, for most of us, that's not going to result in imprisonment. It's not going to result in death. But it still happens. As we seek to do the right thing, we sometimes suffer for it. Okay. You know, our youth in school, when you stand up to a bully okay, who's bullying someone else, okay, you can suffer for that. Okay. As Christians and, and employers, as you're trying to treat your, treat your employees well and make sure they're treated justly, you may not be making the profits of the person down the street. As we seek to do the right thing, as we stand up for for the downtrodden, as we speak for those who have no voice, we can suffer for that. 
And suffering is something that, that we are taught is, is not a good thing. We're taught to avoid suffering almost at all costs. And yet what Peter says is, you know, it's worded here, it's commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering. That word commendable is, is elsewhere translated as grace. It's God's grace if you bear up under suffering that is unjust. There are ways, as you read about suffering in Scripture, that it almost sounds like a good thing. Not because suffering itself is a good thing, but because God brings good out of it. You see, when we suffer, not suffering for doing things wrong that we deserve punishment or consequence of, but when we suffer unjustly, God uses that. The most compassionate people I know have suffered. Suffering makes us into compassionate people who can relate to the suffering of others. And suffering is one of the best things to humble us, to teach us the the virtue of humility, a virtue that is a hard one to learn. When we suffer, God can use that to smooth the rough edges of our character to shape us more into people who look like Jesus and act like Jesus. Peter says that we were called to this kind of suffering because Christ suffered for us. And as we experience unjust suffering, we get a better appreciation of what Jesus has done for us. When we suffer unjustly, we recognize how unjust his suffering was and how willing he was to undertake that for our sakes. When we suffer unjustly, we participate in Christ's own suffering. In a couple weeks, I'll talk about how that is actually a witness to who Jesus is. But as we think about this this idea of suffering and the good that God can bring out of it, I was reminded of something that happened during Holy Week. You may remember that on Palm Sunday of this year, there were Christian churches, Coptic Christians in Egypt, whose churches were bombed, and many were killed. And a Coptic priest, just a few days after that, gave a sermon, a sermon entitled, What Do We Say to Those Who Kill Us? What do we say to those who cause our unjust suffering? And in in the the translation of his sermon, there are two things that, that he primarily says to those who kill us. And the first is, thank you. He says, thank you, and he says, I know that you won't believe us when we say it, but we say thank you to you, and you know why. He said, first of all, we say thank you because you give us to die the same death as Christ, and there could be no higher honor than that, to suffer as our Lord suffered. He says, we say thank you to you because you've shortened our journey. If one is heading home and you're offered a shortcut, a faster way to get there, you say thank you. He said thank you to those who who kill us because you're actually helping us achieve our goal. Our goal of spreading the gospel and letting people know about Jesus. And he said, you're helping us do that. And he looked around the congregation, which was full. And he says, usually on this day, there's only a handful of people here. But because of what you did, people are in church, hearing the gospel. So thank you, he said. And he said, the other thing we say is not just thank you, but we love you. 
To those who kill us, we say we love you. Because Jesus taught us to love not only those who do good for us, but those who harm us. Jesus taught us to love our enemies. And so in our suffering, we can practice that. He said, Jesus Jesus taught us to love you. And therefore, we also pray for you. We pray for those who injure us, those who make us suffer. And he said, specifically for those who cause these bombings, he says, we pray that you can sleep at night. We pray that you find peace. Because somebody who knows peace would never do what you have done. And we pray that you would know the love and forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ. To those who cause our suffering, we say thank you. And we say, I love you. We love you. Because that is what our shepherd has taught us. You see, there's one more thing that our suffering does. Peter wraps up and he says, you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And when we suffer, just like those Coptic Christians who showed up at church that next day, when we suffer, we turn to God. So often when life is easy and things are going well, we think we can handle it all on our own. But when we suffer, we are reminded that we need a shepherd. Suffering is not a good thing. It is not something we seek. But when it comes our way, God can bring good out of it. Because he is our shepherd. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we uh, always do on, on Communion Sundays, as we prepare to come to the table, we profess our faith using those words that are uh, a creed used by the church throughout the world. So let us profess our faith together in unity with our brothers and sisters throughout time and space using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now, as those who belong to Christ, let us return a portion of what he has blessed us with for his use.
Please, please rise and body your spirit for the response. pray with me. Heavenly Father, all things have their origin with you, Lord, and from these riches we freely give that your church might grow in this place and throughout the world. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, when we come to the table, we participate in Christ's suffering because our re- we are receiving his broken body and his poured out blood. Yeah. It is in coming to the table that we are reminded that we belong to him and that we belong to one another and we find that communion with each other. Yeah. And because this is Christ's table, All those who have put their trust in him and been baptized in his name are invited to come to this table to receive from him, to be strengthened and nourished and encouraged and shepherded. So please join me in our great prayer of thanksgiving. The responses are found on page 13 of your hymnal. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe. At your word, the earth was made and spun on, upon its course among the planets. Your hand formed us from the dust of the earth and set us among all your creatures to love and serve you. When we were unfaithful to you, you kept faith with us. Your love remained steadfast. When we were slaves in Egypt, you broke the bonds of our oppression, brought us through the sea to freedom, and made covenant to be our God. By a pillar of fire, you led us through the desert to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. You spoke of love and justice in the prophets, and in the word made flesh you lived among us, manifesting your glory. He died that we might live, and is risen to raise us to new life. And therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who you sent to save us. He came with healing in his touch and was wounded for our sins. He came with mercy in his voice and was mocked as one despised. He came with peace in his heart and met with violence and death. By your power, he broke free from the prison of the tomb, and at his command, the gates of hell were opened. The one who was dead now lives. The one who humbled himself is raised to rule over all creatures, the lamb upon the throne. The one ascended on high is with us always as he promised. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. 
Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. And now, Lord, we ask that you would hear our praises and our intercessions as we lift them to you, either speaking them aloud or praying them silently. And so, nourished at this table, O God, may we who know Christ's redemptive love live a new life in him. Help us recognize our Lord in the breaking of bread, to see and serve him in all whose lives are broken. Give us who are fed at his hand grace to share our bread with the hungry and with the hungry of heart. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And brothers and sisters, remember that on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Brothers and sisters, these are holy things for holy people. And you're invited to come and partake. We will be receiving by uh, intinction. And so I invite you to come up and re uh, as you pass the waters, you're invited to touch the water. If you uh, feel so moved, you can touch it to your forehead if you like. Okay? But that reminder that we enter into Christ's presence through the waters of baptism.
Would you please join with me in our unison prayer after communion? Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now would you please rise in body or spirit and we will join together in our concluding hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. As we faithfully live our lives this week, what does God call us to do? God calls us to be a Christ-centered missional church that proclaims the word of God and demonstrates the relevance of his word to all people. And brothers and sisters, as we leave this place, let us do so not being afraid to suffer, but knowing that God can even use our suffering for our good and his glory. And so go with God's blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide in us each one, this day and always. Hallelujah and amen.